The following program does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Reality Radio 101, its advertisers and sponsors, or its listening audience. Listener discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, where mind, mood and what matters to you are discussed. We're broadcasting live from Toronto, Ontario, Canada on Reality Radio 101. Send us an email. Our email address is in studio 101 at gmail.com And now, right to your host of the Bear Psychology Radio Show, Dr. Anna Baranowski. Hi everyone, I'm so glad to be with you again today. Today we're going to be focused on knowing your shadow. Now, this is a little bit of a, an interesting topic because it's not always clear what this thing of a shadow really is. But I can tell you that unless you do some deep dives with inside of yourself and really start to discover what's inside, it's this underlying content, our unconscious content that can lead us to become enraged over something minor, to struggle in relationships and to feel like we have no idea why that is, to get triggered in the world when in fact there may be not that much to get triggered over, and to really not understand what our own inner demons are doing, like what kind of drivers they harness inside of ourselves and you know what something around a trigger or a sorry a, um, a shadow can be actually very very simple it could be something like in your family of origin people thought that being artsy was a silly and ridiculous thing and they would you know like um uh, point out how you know meaningless those activities are and how worthless it was while all the while deep within inside of yourself you may have seen yourself as a creative and artistic person but you would work very hard to reject that and it becomes your shadow so this creative artistic part of yourself you may have kind of broken it apart from how you operate in the world only to find yourself really longing to move towards something that's um, artistic and creative. And instead of letting it flourish, you may find yourself um, kind of pointing out people who are artistic and being rejecting of them, um, feeling a lot of pain and embarrassment and shame when you uh, have a sense that uh, you're attracted to certain artistic things, art shows, galleries, writing, um, painting, and then find yourself kind of really trying to cut that part of yourself out. And you can imagine how difficult that would be um, in your life, because it would be hard to live authentically, to live with some peace in your life if you're basically taking parts of it and saying, this is unacceptable, I hate that. So, you know, basically that is in a very simple way, uh, a one way to look at shadow. 
Um, you know, and it and it absolutely has a huge, huge cost. So my question to you is, are you aware of the ways in which shadow might be influencing your life? And remember, in Studio 101 is our email address and you can contact us throughout the show um, and just let us know, uh, sorry, it's uh, realityradio101 at gmail.com or instudio101 at gmail.com. And uh, let us know if you have uh, questions or comments or thoughts about the show today. I would love to hear from you. This is what makes it an interesting conversation. Um, today, we were supposed to have Dr. Robert Augustus Masters on the show. Um, I've got his book in front of me. It's called Bringing Your Shadow Out of Dark, Breaking Free from the Hidden Forces that Drive You. Uh, but unfortunately, Dr. Masters is now um, trying to take care of himself and his life. He's just in the process of moving from the West Coast to the East Coast, and he has um, stumbled upon some um, moving crises, which he has to handle personally. So unfortunately, we may be able to get him on at another time. But today, we're going to draw from his work and better understand the issues around uh, shadow and shadow work, um, drawing from the work of um, Carl Jung, which is really where it started. I mean, Carl Jung was really the first one to talk about the shadow, um, to look at um, self-inquiry and uh, the importance of really knowing yourself. Um, and he has a wonderful quote, the most terrifying thing is to accept yourself fully. So why would that be? Why would that be such a terrifying thing? Well, you know, for most of us, all we have to do is um, have a late night where we wake up at three o'clock in the morning with some fearful feelings and we'll understand why it is terrifying to sit with ourselves and really be with ourselves and really sit with the content that can surface when we allow it. I'm really interested in dream work, as some of you have heard. Uh, and I mean, that is the content of the dream work as well. And it can be um, exceptionally interesting. So just for a moment, let, let's just contemplate what, what another person um, is saying about shadow. So this is a comment from Rue who says, my shadow is chronic people pleasing because that's what got me through my childhood. I internalized that I must keep everyone happy or I'll lose the connection to them. You see how that works. This is so interesting, um, Rue, that um, you can see that chronic people pleasing is where you go and how the roots are deeply embedded in childhood. And you see, for most of us, our shadow is content that we use to take care of ourselves, to protect ourselves, to get through something difficult. So it's not something that we should really cut off, but instead we need to notice because usually for Rue anyways, there would likely be some very strong emotions in moments that evoke this need to please other people. So it would be really important for Rue to notice, oh, wow, look at me. I'm I'm pleasing people again. What's the feeling that goes along with that? What am I doing right now to myself in this moment when I feel that I have to please somebody else? You know, this is all around um, what is it that we need to do to stay safe? And yet those old ways of staying safe as a child are likely undermining how we're living as an adult. So Rue goes on to say, what triggers me most are people that behave rudely or very aggressively because one, they refuse to be as nice as I am. Uh, I don't know if you are nice or not, Rue, but I would imagine just like, just like most people who believe that they are good, there are times when in fact we act in ways that actually are not that nice. Um, and that would be a very interesting thing to look at, to kind of contemplate where are the moments when in fact you, you just, you don't, 
you're not really doing the nice thing. I'm not saying there's anything bad with that because I actually believe that uh, you know, even when we love people dearly, we do many things that uh, don't please the other person because, you know, we're all living on our own trajectory and being just nice uh, often is not even possible, even if we wanted it to. And then Guru goes on to say, I'm not allowed to behave like that, which in turn triggers passive aggressiveness so here's where it comes up because you know with the passive aggressiveness you're going to see that not nice behavior seeping through because all of my anger didn't just disappear somewhere it's bottled up and spewing out in weird places and occasions so what would be really super interesting is rue if you were working with journaling um writing out the things that you would really want to do and noticing if you can actually just do it like for example if somebody says uh, I'd really like to go and see a certain movie and you're like well really I don't want to watch that movie um, why is it that it feels even today so dangerous for you to say I don't really want to watch that movie and instead you end up watching the movie and being resentful and frustrated and uh, doing something that's passive aggressive you know, um, because you have this idea, really, that um, if you're, you must be nice in order to uh, maintain your connections, but if you're passive aggressive, the people in your life are probably quite aware that there are times when you're not nice. So um, there's this kind of transparency, I feel uncomfortable saying I don't want to go to that movie or watch that movie with you. Um, it's just not something that interests me, but I am afraid that, um, you know, you'll, you'll reject me or our relationship won't be as strong. It would just be such an interesting experience to notice what happens um, in your relationship if you were able to be transparent in such a way. So then um, Ruth says, um, that's the pattern that I'm working on for a while now. And I can tell from my own experience that it might, um, it might be painful to dig into these touchy subjects that trigger, um, but the uh, rewards are immense. I'm now much more in touch with my rude self. And that's amazing. See, that is incredible. Rude. So here's somebody who's really doing the work to figure out what is actually happening with inside. What are the drivers? Um, you know, why is it so painful to allow oneself to, to, um, to reflect? And I mean, one of the things that Rue is saying is that, you know, there's a real fear that um, there will be rejection, that the only way to maintain relationships is to betray oneself, um, to say yes when, when in fact, you know, Rue is wanting to say no. So very, very profound stuff. And this is what we face. So let's think a little bit about um, the shadow itself and what that actually means, what it looks like, what we might contend with if we're actually facing our shadow. So in this little clip, um, we're going to hear from Dr. Um, Robert Augustus Masters, who is actually talking about what's happening right now with COVID and the kind of fears that people are feeling and the struggles that are getting a vote. Because this is quite the time. I mean, when you think about what's really going on right now in the world and how people are behaving and the kind of fears that COVID is evoking for people. So let's contemplate um, what Dr. Masters is saying. Good question. It's, it's everything's coming up for a lot of people. And at the core of it is fear. Whether we acknowledge it or not, the fear can get into our minds to such a point we get paranoid, we start over focus on conspiracy theories about all of this, or we're just insecure in our job, relationships become more strained perhaps. And there's just everyday anxiety, deeper anxiety, it's a lot of fear. And I think the core of it is fear of death, which is usually an unconscious anxiety in many people, but it's sitting there. We're being rocked. And there's an opportunity here, a tremendous opportunity to grow, but it requires that we actually work with our fear in a way that is effective. That means the fear doesn't control us. 
And we don't get rid of it. You can't get rid of fear, but you can change your relationship to it. So if I'm afraid and I work with it skillfully, I'm not being controlled by the fear. I'm just aware right now, here's fear. It could be grief or anger or sadness, uh, numbness. I'm working with that state. And we'll, uh, later on, I'll we'll get a meditation about all of this uh, effective way of getting into it. But we have to realize our fear is not the problem, even though it's a bit of a pandemic itself right now. It's what are we going to do with this fear besides try and run away from it, distract ourselves from it. And the hard work here, Sandeep, is that we need to turn toward our fearfulness. So it's it's interesting because, you know, we can hear Dr. Masters speak about how fear has intruded into the um, issues related to um, COVID and that that has led toward um, conspiracy theories. And, you know, I think one of the things that the conspiracy theories do is they give people a sense of control. You know, if, if, if I can't believe anything about what's happening with COVID and it's out of my control, at least if I believe something that I could nail down, you know, whatever that conspiracy theory is, then at least I can look to that to reassure me that I have an answer. Well, when we're terrified about not having an answer, if that's a big trigger for us, losing control, um, feeling abandoned, not having solutions, not being able to figure things out, feeling like if I can't figure it out, then I'll die. I mean, literally, I will die. Then, you know, moving towards a conspiracy theory would give people the illusion of having control. And there, you know, there really is so much that is out of our control right now. I mean, even little things like uh, I, I went to the store because I need um, a new bed, but I've gone to maybe five or six stores and none of the beds are available. So I am literally sleeping on two foam mattresses on my floor right now. Um, and it's kind of funny, but I have to be patient and, you know, not be in control. I have to order something and wait eight weeks. And I have to be okay with that because this is the state that we are in right now. I can't have control and I can't come up with um, any solutions other than this is the situation at hand right now and be okay with it. Like, you know, it's kind of, I think there's something about adaptation and being able to say in this moment, what will it take for me to be okay with the circumstance that I'm living with right now, not catastrophize, not turn it into um, more than what it is, um, except not try to bypass. It's, it's okay. You know, I'm not happy with it, the situation, but I recognize it for what it is and I can't pretend that I'm going to be in control of it because I'm absolutely not in control of it. So I want to read a little bit about what uh, Carl Jung says about the meaning of self-knowledge. He says what our age thinks of as the shadow and inferior part of the psyche contains more than something merely negative. The very fact that through self-knowledge, by exploring ourselves, we come up with the instincts and their world imagery should throw some light on the powers slumbering in the psyche of which we are seldom aware so long as all goes well. So what, what he's saying is he's talking about these deep things that live with inside of ourselves that are drivers to how we behave on the outside. And when we really deeply connect with ourselves and understand what is deeply embedded within, then we're not just going to be triggered, we can become much more reflective because we understand what our inner fears and drivers are. And if we're not just reacting to keep them shut down, we can actually respond in a way that is meaningful in, in, the, in the real moment, in this very precise moment in time. So, you know, he goes on to say they are potentialities of the greatest dynamism, and it depends entirely on preparedness and, and attitude of the conscious mind, whether the eruption of these forces and images and ideas associated with them will tend towards construction or catastrophe. 
The psychologist seems to be the only person who knows from experience how precarious the psychic preparedness of modern man is. <laughs> and he is the only one who sees himself compelled to seek out in man's nature those helpful forces and ideas which over and over have enabled the individual to find the right way through darkness and danger. So I'm just going to say this was written a long time ago. Um, and the, uh, so some of the language is not really fitting, but um, it's 1957, 1958. Um, and I will just say that I, I don't think that every psychologist is aware of their shadow or psychic um, underlying material. Um, you know, some people work uh, much more superficially. Um, but I do think it's really important to kind of peel back the layers and try to really work deeply with that inner material because, you know, particularly, and I do think it is true that in terms of our, um, of our happiness and contentment, if we have unconscious dark material um, that we have not yet come to terms with, it will tend to move us in directions that are not fulfilling in our life, overwhelm, and have a, has a very strong impact on how we behave in our lives from moment to moment. So I want to go back to um, Robert Augustus's work and talk a little bit about um, his really, really interesting focus on um, his shadow work. And he describes shadow work um, and inner child work. This idea of inner child um, uh, is, is also an old concept. It's, it's also tied into an idea of core beliefs. Um, so Robert goes on to say shadow work and inner child work share a lot of common ground and in fact become much the same process when we're facing our unattended childhood programming and imprinting. Our inner child is the expression and personification of two factors that are in close conjunction, the intrinsically good qualities of early childhood and our early conditioning, the aspects of such conditioning that are unresolved or hidden are part of our shadow. So working in any depth with our inner child includes to whatever degree working with our shadow elements, and shadow work has to include working with our inner child. After all, childhood is when most of our conditioning was originally implanted. So he goes on to discuss, you know, some of the elements that we should be looking at if, um, you know, this inner child or the shadow related to inner child um, is surfacing. And I'm going to go through each of those with you in a moment. Um, but before we do that, let's just take a, a moment and listen to a little bit more of what uh, Dr. Masters is saying about this fear related to COVID-19. Not all at once. We move too quickly to our most painful, challenging, scary. We tend to rebound back even further. But if we approach it skillfully, and become more intimate with that thing, that quality, that process called fear, we become capable of working with it. It may transmute to anger, passion, excitement, where it may stay as it is, but we're no longer at its mercy. But you just the other part of the I need to emphasize, we cannot think our way out of our fear. For many of us, our fear is pre-rational. It's immune to the most brilliant insights, rational, the considerations of it, it's in our guts, it's primal, and it has to do with survival, life and death, and even if that's not truly the case, it can often feel like it's a life and death situation. So I want to just point out that um, Dr. Masters is reflecting on how primal this experience of encountering the shadow can be, um, and how alive it can be with inside of ourselves, not just a mental phenomena, it's a physically felt phenomena. And I want to just read a comment um, from one of our listeners right now. Hi, Robert. 
Um, Robert says, hello, when we talk about this shadow phenomena, is it just a mental shadow or a physical one as well? And if both, how do they relate to my mental issues? So I'm not sure exactly, Robert, if you want to write back um, with a little bit more of an explanation, I would appreciate it um, while we're still on air. Um, let's just go through what Robert is saying here. Um, this is the, the reader, the, the um, listener, one of our listeners right now. Um, so just to be clear, Robert, um, we can feel, we can perceive the shadow content um, as visceral. It, it's, it's, it's an inner felt experience that can be extremely powerful and felt very clearly in the body. As a matter of fact, in a lot of the work that I do with clients in my clinic or with clinicians that I train is I ask them to spend time really deeply leaning toward that which is alive with inside of ourselves. And when you take that approach and you continue with it layer after layer, you start to become aware of how alive um, the inner uh, lived experience can be. Uh, and, and really, I mean, this, this is the kind of work that takes time and guidance. And if you can get somebody to work with you like that, to really stay with what is um, what is arising from within inside, you're going to start making connections between your historical past, between your deeply embedded um, discomforts, fears, uh, loneliness, you know, whatever is getting um, hooked with inside of yourself. So I would say that they are, you know, very profoundly alive. So you know, usually, so let's say, for example, I go into a store and um, somebody behind me, you know, um, starts, startles me. I, I mean, I hear something very loud and, you know, I turn around and this person is, um, you know, dropping things and causing a commotion. And if that's a trigger for me, I may feel something powerful with inside of myself. I may uh, want to, um, even if the trigger is very strong, I may want to run away, I may want to hide, or I might want to hurt that person. So, you know, these things are inner feelings, fight, flight, or freeze. These are inner sensations but they may absolutely impact my behavior if I am not aware of the trigger and just become very reactive. So it's an interesting question. And it's one that has a lot of different layers, I would say, and something that we would need to really take our time um, understanding a little bit more. Okay, let's listen to a little bit more of what Dr. Masters is saying. And the key to working with fear, in a nutshell, I'll get this more later, is to get inside it, which sounds counterintuitive. It means you approach it, you start to explore its characteristics, its nooks and crannies, you become more familiar with it. So it's not just this thing called fear, it's this complex, evolving, shifting process that involves our body and mind quite frequently, but not to such an extent we can't work with it. Right, yeah, so some of the so what I want to do is now talk a little bit more about the signs that the shadow or the inner child has been evoked. So let's just take our time with this because this is actually this is actually pretty interesting stuff. So uh, signs that you're this is from Dr. Master's work. Um, so this is um, signs that your inner child is showing up or that the inner shadow is showing up. Um, maybe you're noticing you're having outbursts, behaving in an egocentric manner, acting childishly, um, or acting in a way that, you know, when you reflect on it, you're not happy with your own behavior. Okay, so let's start with that. Um, and I'm sure most of us can relate to moments in time when um, we're not happy with our own behavior. And, you know, I don't want you to um feel 
um, uncomfortable about that. You know, it's, it's something that can happen to anybody. And it's something that, um, you know, it, it, this is going to be more about you learning that there are moments in time when you really, really want to be able to make sense of your own behavior. It's a learning opportunity. That's what I want to say. And it really, really is. So let's think of this. Okay. Um, here they are. Um, reactivity. When we're reactive, reverting to knee-jerk, emotionally disproportionate behavior, the wounded child in us is taking center stage, showing up through our speech, movements, intentions, and manner of relating. And we're on autopilot, usually very resistant uh, to any feedback um, or even admitting that, you know, in the moment that something's going on, you know, somebody might say, Hey, are you okay? Seems like something's going on. And we may be like, nothing's going on. I'm not angry. Everything's fine. <laughs> right. Or maybe you may find yourself freezing. You know, that's a normal response when we sense that there's some kind of danger and we want to be able to respond with that, um, to notice that something's actually going on. So a child who can't run away or fight is usually going to go into some kind of a um, recoiling or freezing mode and experiencing um, a, an inner discomfort that is happening. So what we might expect um, when this happens is a child um, in us has been activated we're caught in some kind of a default mode um, where we feel frightened and overwhelmed. And it may remind us very much of a time when we were much younger and less able to tolerate, um, you know, the struggles. OK, um, or maybe it might be an exaggerated sense of abandonment or rejection. So now I find this one really, really interesting. So, you know, um, Years ago, there was a Dr. Spock, and Dr. Spock had um, kind of requested that people leave their uh, infants alone to cry through the evening um, because that was supposed to make them stronger, um, when in fact, it actually likely led to a state of neglect um, and a lack of trust in their uh, baseline. So it so if we find that something creates a sense of abandonment like oh this is a good example so um dr masters sent me a email and uh in the email he said he's really sorry you know that he's now in a crisis state with this move things have evolved that he didn't expect i mean you know these things happen right so you know if i'm going to run a radio show it's kind of my responsibility to have a you know other plans in place to carry the show in case of these kinds of events. So if that email triggered inside of me an exaggerated sense of abandonment or rejection, then it probably would have been impossible for me to, um, to, uh, to run the show today because I would have been in a state of discomfort, uh, a feeling like I'd been abandoned or that, you know, I can't carry on, I'm frozen in rejection, something like that, right? So, um, you know, life demands that we figure these things out, figure out what our triggers are because otherwise they will run how we live our life. Here's another one, an overwhelming sense of existential helplessness. This sense may be characterized by us throwing up our hands in the air and sinking into a what's the point depressiveness when our circumstances really are not all that bad. There are times in many cases when we as young children or infants we're in no, a, no, a no exit situation that were far from pleasant and the only solution was to mute our vital signs and uh, not so this basically means that you've learned how to turn off your needs and become numb. And in fact, learn how to bypass um, what you're actually experiencing or feeling. So it's a deadening inner experience. 
it's it's kind of a, a difficult place to be, but it definitely is something that happens. I mean, sometimes people go into this um, state of collapse. So believe me, that's also kind of the, the shadow content coming to the surface. So I would ask you to just be aware that that's a real thing and it can lead you to become very depressed um, and to believe that there's no way, no hope available. And sometimes, I mean, you may actually know somebody who acts like this, that lower level events can create such a feeling of collapse. Um, or maybe this is something that happens to you. And then I would ask you really sit with this for a moment. See if you can be really gentle with yourself around the inner experience of collapse. Like really lean into it with a kind of a gentle kind of um, willingness to meet and tend to that inner experience of collapse. Not so that you can, you know, make it bigger or smaller or anything, but just be really super curious about the experience of it, what it feels like, where it comes from, what it drives in your life. So let's go into some of the questions. So this is from Monica. Hi, Monica. Thank you for writing in. Hello. If and when my shadow is present, should I always listen to it or sometimes ignore it? Scary stuff. What a great question, Monica. In fact, there are absolutely times in life where we want to actually just do life. And, you know, I'm not suggesting for anybody that, you know, every moment is a time when you should be kind of reflecting into the shadow. But I do love the idea of taking time um, and finding um, some place and time where you can actually commit to doing that work. And I like writing because writing is actually a very powerful thing to do um, if you're working on your own and you don't have um, you know, a therapist specifically, journaling is wonderful. And I like some of the work with the uh, Dr. Masters is actually really helpful because he brings out some really good exercises um, in a few of his um, books. Uh, and, and he also has some audio books as well that allow you to, to do that work deliberately. So I wouldn't say that Every moment in time when you're triggered or the inner child is getting wounded is a time to do that. But I would say that you could make a commitment to yourself to do that inner work and let yourself really um, attend to the places that are wounded with inside. Um, they will definitely this kind of thing will definitely free up energy for you over time because the old wounds won't um, have so much of a grip over you. So, so of course, you know, you could, you could jot it down and just say, today, I want to work with my sense of abandonment. You know, Dr. Masters told me he can't come to the radio show. Um, and it makes me feel really, really bad. I'm going to come back and work on that. Um, and maybe not now, maybe I'm going to do that work uh, when when I have the space and time to attend to it properly. And maybe I have something else to work on right now. And that's really important not to um, feel like you have to do something right this moment. So thank you for that question, Monica. It's excellent. Um, and now let's read from Bob. Um, hi, Bob. Bob is calling. Hi, I just tuned in from Plano, Texas. How wonderful. That's great. So I'm so glad to um, to hear from you, Bob. Um, what does core level shadow mean? Look, uh, I have to say that um, this idea of core level or shadow, I think it's synonymous. I think that when we're dealing with these core elements of ourselves, that is the shadow. It's like, you know, when there, there's lots of different ways to come to the same thing, like the inner child, um, core beliefs, uh, inner work, shadow work, you know, these things can all mean the same. But the idea is that we're trying to get deeply with inside of ourselves and know what our inner drivers are, know how to attend to the content that gets evoked with inside this is very powerful stuff. So what I would be aware of is that, you know, there are elements with inside of ourselves that are deeply embedded drivers. 
And we just want to be able to start to have an opportunity to witness that which is deepest with inside. I'm going to read a little bit from The Undiscovered Self by Carl Jung. Um, and again, this is from the um, 1957. So um, this is Young's idea of a prescription for salvation, distilling the experience of a lifetime. Um, Dr. Young believes that the salvation of the world consists in the salvation of the soul. That's that kind of, you know, uh, Bob is is mentioning core level shadow. Um, so, you know, Young, in this book, The Undiscovered Self, is describing that deep stuff as the soul. But that only when the individual discovers his true inner nature can he accept the gift of a meaningful life form. You know, it's it's pretty provocative when we think about this, that, um, you know, we have this opportunity to do this very, very deep work with inside of ourselves. It's not easy work to really attend to the the things that frighten us the most. So thank you for that um, comment and question, Bob. And um, and then let's um, think about what Rita's saying. Hi, Rita. Um, I noticed that Dr. Masters is also a sex therapist. Is he related to the world famous Masters and Johnson's team of the sixties and seventies? No, I don't. I don't think that. Um, he has a connection with the Masters and Johnson work. Boy, that is really, really important work. Um, the work of Masters and Johnson's and, you know, how they really revolutionized our thinking around sexuality. However, you know, um, Dr. Masters actually refers to relationships and sexuality in his work and how it's actually a really important piece of work and how, you know, some of the drivers, some of the sexual drivers um, can really uh, take us in directions where we're not really being fully aware of our uh, drives and inclinations. And we may actually, in some cases, be using sex in a way to numb ourselves rather than to fully be present in our relationships. One of the things that Dr. Masters does a lot of is relationship work. So, you know, if you want to listen to a few of his YouTube videos, they're quite interesting, especially with um, he and his, um, I think it's his second wife, um, of 10 years and they talk a lot about being present and what that really looks like and how you can um, agree or disagree or have struggles in the relationship but still be with that person fully um, connected so that's kind of a nice uh, uh, reality but I don't think that that um, the, uh, the work is related to Masters and Johnson specifically. So let's listen a little bit more to what um, we're hearing from um, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Masters rather. To connect with something that was- Who is- um, Full of shame. I would sit maybe facing the other man and tell the truth, yes, be vulnerable, but sit in the shame with some dignity, don't crumb, don't grovel, uh, as trying to get away from the, from the shame, stay with it. It's unpleasant, but it will burn through you quickly if you sit in it. It doesn't get worse. And then we can make So now I think this is really interesting. So what he's talking about is as we allow ourselves to really sit with a very strong emotion, in this case, he's talking about shame, when we're not recoiling from it, when we're not trying to shut it down or reject it, or turn away from it, bypass it, that the experience of fully allowing shame in this case to surface fully, we can allow ourselves to integrate it. So we have an opportunity of understanding the moment that evokes the shame, the feeling, the experience of the shame, and give ourselves some space so that we can uh, kind of come to accept and be 
kind of one with the shame because the reality is, is all the strong emotions that you may feel inside of you that you may want to suppress or turn away from or repress or shut down. Who is that? Like, who is that that is feeling it? So who is that that is feeling it is is us? You know, this is all us. And so the more we allow ourselves to discover that which is living inside, the less we're battling with ourselves, the more we can sit at peace with our own inner lived experience. And that piece of it is the profound work of growth and change. And once we are really committed to that, we can grow in ways that are remarkable. So now I'm going to go back to more about the inner child or the inner shadow um, when it starts coming up. We could also experience magical thinking. So this is a pre-rational cognition in which we assume that we have or can have a causal role in events that we actually have no control over. So when you think now about what's happening with COVID um, and a lot of conspiracy theory issues, this can be also magical thinking. So sometimes if you talk to somebody who's embedded in a lot of conspiracy theory content, if you really kind of ask open questions about, you know, what these what these beliefs are or how they came to them or you know you know what what their deeper thoughts about them are um what the logic is behind it whether there's some um evidence uh you start to see that the the strands are rather loose and um that there may be some make believe stuff going on and that it it, it's not very strong and rational. It's not based necessarily on, um, you know, strong evidence of any kind. So, you know, children in early childhood, you know, you know, they think in these magical ways. You know, they may come up with, um, you know, ideas of, you know, let's say the sun they may look at the sun and a four-year-old child might assume that the sun is following them as they walk along. And this shows up in adulthood, um, you know, in various forms. Like if, you know, you were using magical thinking as a child, you know, this may become um, embedded in the way in which you look at your life, especially if it was somehow uh, helpful for you, if things were very difficult in your life then you may have learned to use magical thinking in a way that um, worked for you as a child. And then you, you bring that into your adult life. So when we get lost in magical thinking, we kind of regress to an earlier um, age in our life. So for better, as in creative throws or artistic work, or for worse, as in egocentric spirituality of those who believe that um, all we have to do is change our reality to change our realities, to think differently, um, rather than to do something concrete. So, you know, if something terrible is going on, we may actually have to take very um, concrete and significant steps to improve a situation. But magical thinking can show up. And we could start thinking that, um, you know, some wonderful thing will occur. Like if I Uh, buy a certain um, um, ticket on a certain day, um, I might win the lottery. Um, So, you know, it gives us a sense of power over things, which we have absolutely no power. Um, And, you know, when we're going through, especially times like now with COVID, when we have so little power, magical thinking um, is being used a lot. So you don't have to you don't have to look very far to see how how often people are using magical thinking. Okay, Um, this is from Tommy and Tommy says, I did a little bit of research on shadow work. But my question is this. I know that this psychological experience is based on social and emotional experiences. But what about spiritual realms? 
Well, thank you very much for that question, Tommy. I, I think that, in fact, um, a lot of the shadow work um, comes from um, an element of spiritual realms because um, Jung, who, who came up with this idea of the shadow, he was the first one to kind of use um, the, the language of shadow. And he embedded it very deeply into mystical or psycho-spiritual realms. And, you know, certainly, you know, his work is at the core of, of this um, element. Now, it's interesting because the work of Carl Jung is quite phenomenal. Jung had a lot of dreams that one would actually look at as quite mystical. Um, he had these visions that many would say were um, psycho-spiritual, and he had... Um, taken his time in putting together something called the Red Book. I have the Red Book sitting right beside me. It's actually quite a, um, a, a dense volume with these magical, remarkable images that are, are actually quite profound. So I have the, um, the Red Book, the Liber, Liber Novus, um, in front of me. And um, it's edited and introduced by Sanu Shem Dasani. And, you know, it is probably one of the most profound uh, uh, documents that actually addresses, you know, this, this idea of the shadow. So if you want to look really deeply at um, psychological experience and uh, spiritual realms in the shadow, um, the Red Book, uh, Liber Novus um, by Carl Jung. Now, Liber... Interestingly enough, um, the, the book was um, compiled for actually years, 1914 to 1930, um, but it wasn't published until recently, I think 2007. And, um, you know, Jung really did a lot of uh, deep inner reflection. And he had to allow some very, very scary things to come to the surface. I mean, here you see an extremely prominent uh, psychologist who is writing something that that reveals um, something mystical. And I don't think he really wanted any of this to come to the surface. He was actually quite concerned that when his, uh, if the Red Book was published um, before, while he was still alive, it may have undermined his, um, his uh, profession. And uh, I think that was very scary for him. So in the Red Book itself on page 198, Liber Novus, he writes, my most difficult experiment. This is Carl Jung. This is from the Liber Novus. Uh, right from the book. In 1912, Jung had some significant dreams that he did not understand, gave particular importance to two of these, which he felt showed the limitation of Freud's conceptions of dreams. The first follows. I was in a southern town on a rising street with narrow half landings. It was 12 o'clock midday, bright sunshine, an old Austrian customs guard or someone similar passes by me, lost in thought, someone says, this is one who cannot die. He died already 30 to 40 years ago, but has not managed to decompose. I was very surprised. Here a striking figure came, a knight of powerful build, clad in yellowish armor. He looks solid and inscrutable and nothing impresses him. On his back, he carries a red Maltese cross. He's continued to exist from the 12th century and daily between 12 and one o'clock midday, he takes the same route. No one marvels at these two apparitions, but I was extremely surprised. I hold back my interpretive skills as regards the old Austrian. Freud occurred to me as regards the king, the knights, I myself inside a voice calls. It is all empty and disgusting. I must bear it. 
So in, in the Liber Novus, he says, Jung says, Jung found this dream op oppressive and bewildering, and Freud was unable to interpret it. Around half a year later, Jung had another dream. I dreamt at that time, it was shortly after Christmas 1912, that I was sitting with my children in a marvelous and richly furnished castle apartment, an open columned hall. We were sitting at a round table whose top was a marvelous dark green stone and suddenly a gull or dove, dove flew in and sprang lightly onto the table. I admonished the children to be quiet so they would not scare away the beautiful white bird. And suddenly this bird turned into a child of eight years, small blonde girl, and ran around playing with my children in the marvelous columned colonnades. Then, then the child suddenly turned into a gull or dove. She said the following, only in the first hour of the night can I become human while the male dove is busy with the 12 dead. With these words, the bird flew away and I awoke. So I'm not going to try to uh, interpret it in any way, but, you know, I think what I want to contemplate is just the fact of how deep and complex it can be to really allow that which is surfacing to surface. Because, you know, Jung had to do his own inner work in order to come to terms with what was really surfacing for him. And it was scary work for him because he was uncertain about what was being revealed and in his uncertainty, he kept collecting and reflecting. And it was a massive psychological, psycho-spiritual um, experience for him. You know, you, you can't see the, the images that I'm looking at. But in, in the Red Book, there are these incredibly profound um, images that um, Carl Jung um, painted and drew and um, some of them are actually quite frightening um, but they all have this very vivid profound element in one image there's a, a, a human figure in red and black and by this uh, this human figure there's a serpent that's woven around a foot and a what looks like a spear of some sort um, embedded in, in the figure's chest with a um, by another figure that is half cloaked um, within the, uh, the, the image itself, um, very difficult to see. So, you know, what these are all about is, um, you know, really the shadow work, you know, what, what's really lurking with inside and, and really taking the time to reflect on that. So um, just uh, the last um, um, email is from John. Hello, John. Um, John says, wonderful show today. I read Dr. Master's blog about his heart attack. First and foremost, I am very sorry to hear about that unfortunate event. However, what a writer. Yeah, he is. He's quite a good writer. Um, John says the way that Dr. Master's story was explained left no questions about what happened and what ended up being a very successful result. Love his writing style. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing such a personal experience with hundreds, if not thousands of readers. Yeah. So I will make sure that, um, that uh, Dr. Masters um, gets a copy of this show because it's, it's actually got a lot of elements that are related to his work and good comments. And thank you very much for that as well, John. I want to end today with just a little bit of information on working with your inner child. First of all, this is the shadow work. Um, 
you know, really acknowledge that there is something going on deeply with inside of yourself. So, you know, allow yourself, whatever the inner experience is, whether it's anger or fear, shame, resentment, you know, see if you can allow yourself to really leave some space for that. Second, allow yourself to really engage in an empathetic, a kind of friendliness towards what is surfacing with inside. And third, make a commitment to do the work because once you make that commitment, you're actually opening up a door of communication from within inside of yourself. You're saying, yes, I am showing up for you. And after all, if we can learn how to show up for ourselves in a really meaningful, in a fully um, committed way, you know, we're, we're allowing ourselves, we're encouraging ourselves to grow and evolve and become what we really want to become in this world. And finally, make a commitment as well to love and protect that which is evolving and surfacing from inside of yourself. And if you do this on a really regular basis, even, even if it is an opportunity to just say every day, I'm going to take 15 minutes and I am going to sit quietly with that which is arising. I hope all of you have a gentle day. Love to speak with you today. And um, we'll speak with you again next month. Be well and enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank you for listening to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, right here on Reality Radio 101.